Hi everybody, my name is Matthew Shagam. I am a local SAT-ACT tutor in the northwestern Vermont area, and we're here at VSAX College Pathways 2020 doing the strategies for the SAT and ACT presentation. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for joining us, and uh, we're gonna do our best to make sure that we talk about what to the SAT and ACT are, how they're scored, what colleges are looking at, how they use those scores, and then some basic strategies and resources to help you get started preparing for that test. So to start with, Let's go ahead and take a look at how colleges actually evaluate your scores. What are they doing with these things? So the first thing to understand is that these are standardized tests. They're not IQ tests. This is not about evaluating some kind of IQ in the background thing. Uh, what this is about is comparing you against everybody else who takes these tests. So for example, imagine for a moment that you took the test on take your genius to test day and you go in and you take, a, we'll just say an SAT, and you do great at it. You get every question right on each section except for one question. Pretty good. Well, everybody else who's taken the test is a genius. They're levitating the pencils with their minds, that kind of X-Men stuff, and they do better than you. They get every question right on each section. So what's your score? Well, the way that it works is, is that if you got just one question wrong on each section, but everybody else who took the test got every question right, you get a 200. Now, flip that around and imagine you took the test on take your pet test day, and you go in and you don't do very well. You only get one question right per section, but everybody else who's taking the test is a puppy or kitten of some sort, and they have no thumbs. They cannot hold the pencils. They do very poorly. Well, you got one question right. They got every question wrong. What's your score? It's 800. Because again, remember, this is a standardized test. It's about comparing you against the other students who take these tests, not about some objective measure of IQ or this thing or that thing. So colleges will always give you the benefit of the doubt on these tests. So you can see on the PowerPoint here that how colleges evaluate your scores, well, they're gonna give you the best single time out or the super score method. They're gonna take your best verbal, your best math, or if it's ACT, they'll take your best English, your best uh, reading, your best math, your best science, across multiple administrations, add those up and give you a new super score. Colleges use one of these two methods. Most schools are moving more towards a super score method, especially since the ACT is now allowing section by section administrations. So that's a new policy, but basically after your first round out, you can just retake take the math or just retake the science, not the whole test. So I expect that pretty much most colleges are going to be taking the super score method in the coming years over the single best time out. But one way or the other, they're going to give you that benefit. Now, there's a lot of reasons for that. Some of them are very good. So one of them is that. How do colleges actually know how to compare students? Well, if you compare the best time out, the good news is, is that there's really only one reason why you would get a good score, and that's because you did well and were focused and able to show up, whereas there's a number of reasons why you might get a low score. Uh, you know, you might have had a traffic accident that morning. You might have gotten hit in the head with a baseball the night before. You might have a broken arm, just can't fill out stuff that well. Could be a number of reasons why you would get a low score. But again, realistically, there's only one reason why you'd get a good score. You know what you're doing. And that's the way colleges look at it. Other reasons why they do this, it helps their U.S. News and World, rank, uh, World Report rankings. And that's important to colleges. So again, don't worry about retests. If you do better, it'll help your score. If you do worse, it won't harm your score or your admissions profile. So moving on, I want to talk a little bit about the testing timeline because most students who will be watching this presentation are likely to be sophomores. Maybe there's some juniors, especially as time goes on, get a little bit into the mix. But generally speaking, the calendar for taking these tests is that if possible, you want to try and take one of these tests for real by the first administration of the spring of your junior year. So first test you can, springtime, junior year. Why is that? Well, there's this phenomenon that happens that if you wait longer, what you're going to find is, or what generally happens is, is you got to think about the seniors. When are the seniors going to have their applications due? Well, that's going to be December, January-ish of their senior year, maybe a little earlier for early action, early decision. That means that by the springtime tests, 
the seniors are out of the pool. They have their applications already in. So what you see is you got all these seniors, seniors going up, going up, going up, and then they get all out and you're just left with juniors with those springtime tests. So if you've been working early to get ready for these tests, you're gonna be in a real good position to do well relative to the other students who are taking this test. Um, in my own personal experience, I've found, for example, on the ACT, it tends to be about a point per section, which on a composite score, that can really be nice to have an extra point coming your way just because you got started early. SAT, pretty comparable. I don't see a difference in both tests this way. So generally speaking, if you can be prepared, so if you can start the end of your sophomore year around summertime to take that test in the, uh, the first administrations of your spring junior year, you'll be in good position. After that, you want to think about taking the subject tests if you are looking at one of the highly competitive schools. Now, generally speaking, I'm not going to be talking much about the subject test. I should probably take a moment now and talk a little bit about questions. So, unfortunately, this is a recorded uh, lesson, and I'm not able to take live questions. I normally do in this presentation. So, I'm going to put my email in here, and then I'll repeat it again at the end of this presentation. But you can send questions to me directly at, uh, sorry, mshagam, M-S-H-A-G-A-M, at gmail.com. And I believe we're going to try and set up a Q&A session. So, if I receive any questions via email, um, I will go ahead and include those in the general session as well. But so generally, if you have questions about the subject test, feel free to email me. But broadly speaking, the subject test is just a one-hour exam on a given topic. So for example, the Spanish subject test, just about Spanish. There's no math, no English, no verbal on it. Um, likewise, world history, biology, just about world history, just about biology. They're one hour long and you can take up to three of them at an administration. And again, only the most competitive colleges are looking for these things with the possible exception of a language exam. Some colleges use them to complete your language requirement and clip out of those or get out of those classes. Uh, once you have your actual SAT ACT score, assess where you are, think about what colleges you're looking at. So these days there's a lot more calendar or sorry calculators to help you figure out whether or not your score is on the right track for what you're looking for. Uh, the biggest thing I know is that a lot of the schools in the area have Naviance. You can take your SAT ACT scores, you can take your GPA, feed them into the Naviance calculator and get your admissions chances. If you don't have access to that, I know Prep Scholar Dot com offers a comparable free calculator right on their website for each school. So one way or the other, try to get a sense of how it plays in with your GPA. And if you are doing well and it looks like you've got strong chances, something well above that 50% threshold, then you can consider not taking this test again. Again, weighing other factors such as how many schools you're applying to, financial aid, geography, all of that good stuff. But at least you can figure out, am I even on track for this kind of school with this score? Rule of thumb, if you're not going to use that is your percentage on your test should be higher than the number of students rejected or the percentage of students rejected by that school. So if your school rejects 90% of its applicants, your scores had better be above that 90th percentile and probably significantly higher than that. But at least it gives you a threshold to say, am I even in the ballpark here? Again, your score should be higher than the percentage of students rejected. If they reject half, your score should be above half. They reject 75, better be above 75. I'd add a little weight to that, but again, at least you're in the right ballpark if you are meeting that standard. Um, and then over the summer, see about where you are, where you're thinking, if new schools pop up on your list. Again, try to calculate so that you're using Naviance or Prep Scholar so you have some information about where you're headed. And then go ahead and retake the test if necessary if you're still wildly, or I shouldn't say wildly, but if you're still somewhat off track, take it again in the fall and um, go from there with it. So one thing to understand about all of these tests is that the old guessing penalties are all gone. These days you do want to guess on both the SAT and the ACT. The guessing strategy is pretty straightforward. If you have uh, eliminated answer choices and you got it down, let's say there's four choices, you've got it down to two, take an educated guess. But what happens if you're just running out of time or there's just a block at the end of the section you don't know and you just have to leave them blank? How should you guess for that? Well, here's how you optimize your guessing strategy. Wait till the end of the section, maybe leave a minute or two, take a look at your answer choices, 
Look at the answer you feel you have answered the least and guess that letter into all of the blanks. In a modern test, A, B, C, and D all show up equally, uh, as equally as frequently with each other. The reason why is because a test maker doesn't want to reward a student who Christmas trees A over B. That's bad design. They don't want to reward students just for picking the right letter to fill in all the blanks. What they really want to do is make sure that if you're guessing straight letters, you're not doing any better than anybody else who's guessing the next letter. So that means all the letters show up as frequently as each other, generally speaking. If you look at the answers that you've selected and there's a letter that seems to be missing or is not as frequent as the other ones, that's the letter you want to guess and guess that letter in all the blanks because chances are that letter you haven't answered as much is overrepresented in the blank letters or blank spaces. Um, and that's basically the guessing blind strategy on a modern standardized test. It's the same for the SAT and for the ACT. So here's a percentile chart. Um, you are looking at this at home, so you should be able to see that relatively clearly. But if you aren't, or if you want to see a little bit more information, these charts that I'm showing you are taken from the official ACT and SAT information. So this is going to be available on the sheets on their websites. If you search SAT percentiles, ACT percentiles, this should be the first form that pops up on the Google results. And so you can see right here, the biggest thing that colleges are looking for is the percentage. The 36, the 800 numbers, they're just means to getting the colleges the actual percentiles that they want. So we take a look and we see here 36, 100%. Really, that's a little bit mistaken. It should be the 99th percent. Technically, nobody's 100%, but this is their chart, and we go from there. And so um, coming back down, you can see that the 50th percentile on the composite column, that is around, let's see, 20 is what they have on this chart. That's consistent from test over test, and then you can see each of the subsection scores and where they come out as a percentage in each of their columns as well. So don't get too hung up, 27, 28, 22, whatever it is. It's really the percentiles that matter, and so these are what you want to be thinking about. Moving right along, you can see the same thing here for the SAT percentiles. Again, we've got this broken out um, by the nationally representative sample and the SAT user, and then they give you the percentiles and then how you did combined uh, in that left-hand column in each of the three big boxes. So one thing I just want to briefly point out is that the SAT actually reports two scores. They report this nationally representative score and they present this SAT user score. At this point, I don't know which, college, which one the colleges are using more. Um, the SAT user is you compared with everybody else who took that test with you on the same day. The nationally representative sample is your score compared against what the SAT makers think is going to be the distribution of scores across the population. Uh, the SAT user, that's the same way the ACT comes up with their score. They go ahead, they do their work, they think they've put together a test that's got, you know, one third easy, one third medium, one third hard or so, and that's where they come up with the, the kind of general bell curve. They give the test, they go ahead and adjust it afterwards to make sure that they get that nice neat bell curve where, uh, you know, there's a clear 99th, 1%, and then everybody's in the right amounts for the other percentages. And um, this is kind of why you get the discrepancy between the national representative sample and the SAT user. But for the time being, I encourage students to use the SAT user score. It's the most comparable with the ACT and is likely to be the one that colleges ultimately end up using as a result of that. Um, and here you can see the section scores. These are what you would get percentile-wise from one section to the other. Again, you can see uh, the representative user in the SAT user columns. And again, you can see that we've got the reading and the math alongside there. Won't spend too much time on these because, again, uh, you can check these out on your own. If you have questions about them, you can email me. Um, and otherwise, I want to get into how you should actually start preparing for these tests. So you've gone ahead, you've 
started the college process, hopefully it's somewhere around the end of your sophomore year. I think the perfect time to start is towards then. Any earlier, chances are you haven't developed the skills that you're gonna need to succeed. Much later, you don't really have time to improve your skills if you do need them to hit your target school. But summer of sophomore year is a good time to take your first practice test. So the number one advice is always take a practice test before taking the real thing. I know a lot of students like to start off by just walking in there. They're pretty cold. They're pretty much blind to the instructions, just see how they do. In theory, if you're prepared to retake and you take it early enough, there's nothing wrong with that. I just think it's a little bit of a waste of your time and your money. Go ahead, take a practice test first, learn the instructions, see how the timing feels, do a dry run. Both test makers make tests available online. They're happy to get them to you, figure something out. Um, College Board's actually done a lot with this recently. They partnered with the Khan Academy and they have 10 tests up on their website site. All of them are very real and similar to what you are going to see on test day. ACT, not quite as user friendly, um, but they do make their tests relatively accessible as well. Uh, you, of course, you can contact your guidance department. You walk in there. They should have a, you know, a few pamphlets of printed tests available or can order them or point you in the right direction to get a practice test or two. Generally speaking, what I don't recommend students do is spend a whole lot of time taking test after test after test after test for practice. You're going to see an improvement the first time to the second time you take one of these practice tests because now you know what you're doing and you have the speed down or at least a sense of it. But generally speaking, the gains start to diminish pretty quickly if you're just retaking test after test. So you take your first test, you see how you do, maybe you take a second test just to see if you improve, if you master a bit, and maybe if you're close to your target, that'll get you over the line. But if not, then the second test is just going to be how much you improve from learning the rules. And after that, you really have to start getting into the individual skills and learning them in order to improve much more from that. So taking a look at that, let's go ahead and get right into what are the actual content categories and what do you need to know and be working on to succeed with these. So the first thing is that the content on the math on both tests is pretty identical to each other. One thing that you're going to see is that a lot of the differences between the two tests since the revision of the SAT about two, three years ago is that they become more similar to each other. One of those areas is the math. Um, there used to be a lot more geometry on the older SAT. They've really reduced that in favor of focus on functions. And so I want to go through uh, basically what the main categories are. And then we'll talk a little bit about what each of the tests does differently from the other. So. First things first, both tests are going to cover what you've learned in your math class all the way up through basic trigonometry. You could see some introductory trig elements on the SAT. ACT goes a little bit further and starts getting into um, some rotations involving um, radians and some basic other trig concepts on the coordinate plane. And so what you see here to start with though is you've got odds and evens, remainders, exponent rules, prime numbers, and roots. I want to stop there because these are basic concepts. They are not easy concepts. So I've tutored students who are looking at graduate school. They're taking their GMATs or GREs or DATs or OATs or whatever. It, almost exactly the same issues around, for example, exponents. You don't do exponents much. Nobody does uh, these days, except for maybe epidemiologists, but we'll leave that aside. Uh, and so what you end up doing with this is forgetting the rules. And so I see the college kids, they come in, they've forgotten the same rules. What happens to a negative number raised to a negative fractional exponent inside parentheses that themselves are raised to a negative fractional exponent? None of these rules are hard on their own, but you put them all together and it becomes pretty complicated pretty quick. So you want to make sure you review some of these fundamentals before you go any further. Again, in particular, the exponent rules. Prime numbers, evens, odds, less important, but it's still good to know what happens when you multiply an odd times an odd, an even times an even, an even times an odd, and generally what those patterns are. 
After that, you're gonna cover the stuff you see in your algebra classes. So you're gonna have basic one variable algebra at the start, and then you have two variable algebra, which shows up quite a bit. You have the classic, you know, uh, Steve is selling hot dogs and hamburgers. A hot dog costs $2, a hamburger costs three. He earned $37 and sold, you know, 12 hot dogs and five hamburgers, or excuse me, I shouldn't say that. He sold some hot dogs and some hamburgers. You probably have to figure out how many hot dogs or hamburgers he sold, but that's the classic two variable question that's based around the word questions. And then you have the other two variable type around basically graphing lines on the coordinate plane. A lot of y equals mx plus b stuff. And when I say y equals mx plus b, and if you're not sure what I'm talking about, that's definitely a sign that you want to start reviewing your two variable uh, algebra because they do, again, a fair amount of lines, intercepts, uh, where they the two lines intercept each other, where they intercept the xy axis, stuff's pretty common, so you want to start there. After that, you will see quadratics, so that's going to be your good old quadratic formula, negative b uh, plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac, all of that over 2a. That shows up in particular on the SAT. It's fairly uncommon on the ACT. I see it once in a blue moon that they require you to know that, or it's very helpful to know that. You're trying to find the roots of some quadratic that's a little tricky and you need to know that, but it does definitely show up on the SAT. Um, I haven't seen a test where it's not been used or been very, very useful. Um, geometry is still on both tests. It's no longer nearly as important. You're not seeing as many problems, but you do see triangle area questions. You see circle area questions. You see a lot of the proportional parts of a circle. So the angle measure of a wedge or a sector, as it's more properly called, of a circle, that's proportionate to the area of that sector out of the whole circle. Those types of geometry concepts still show up pretty, pretty frequently. So one thing is that um, in the in-person uh, lessons, we do have a formula bank, and I believe VSAC is gonna make that formula bank available for download if it is not already. That is all the formulas you need for the SAT and pretty much all that you'll need for the ACT. Occasionally I see a strange uh, formula pop in, but do work with the formula bank. So let me explain that, because one mistake mistake that I see very frequently that students make is they'll do practice, you'll go ahead, you'll come across a problem, you'll go, oh, I could do this problem if I could remember the formula. Oh, well, I guess I'll just take a guess at it, get it wrong in practice, and move right on. Uh, that's not useful in practice. What you want to do there is you want to have the formula bank in front of you. You see the problem, you go, oh, I, I could do this if I had the formula. Look at the formula. Make a mark next to it. It's not going to help you with the other things you need to be developing, which are problem breakdown skills, identifying patterns, learning how these things come up again and again, to just go ahead and stop right there and get it wrong because of the formula. Look at the formula, apply the formula, learn how to break the problem down further past that formula stage. And like I said, make a little mark next to that formula every time you need it. And the reason why is because as you get to the week before test day, you can take a look at your own formula bank and see which formulas have a bunch of checks next to them. Those are the formulas you need to be memorizing because those are the formulas that show up frequently on the test and that give you trouble with remembering them. So it's a way to help you self-diagnose a little bit better about where you need in math, what, what skills you need to develop, while also still helping you build the important other skills than just formula memorization. After that, there's a few pieces of other uh, topics that show up on the test. We've got some statistics concepts, mean, uh, mode, median. Um, one thing I want to update is that I've seen uh, students struggling with standard deviation. That's the last of the fundamental statistical concepts they need for this test. Remember, standard deviation is how far, on average, each piece of data is from the average of all the data. So spread out data has a bigger standard deviation than bunched up data. That's going to have a small standard deviation. You do want to review that because I've seen it's a new concept for these tests. They didn't use to test it until about two, three years ago. Um, with the new SAT revision, it's become much more frequent. So make sure you familiarize yourself with standard deviation. You don't have to know the formula. The formula is kind of a little bit of a nightmare, but you do need to know what the 
concept is? Because those questions are actually pretty simple um, to answer once you know it. It's just a matter of knowing the one with the bunched up numbers has smaller deviation, the one with the spread out numbers has greater standard deviation. But if you don't know that fundamental, you're going to get that question wrong and it's usually easily avoidable. Um, finally, a little bit more statistics, combinations and permutations. I'm going to take a moment here and talk about a topic I don't like to discuss, and that is calculators. I don't like to discuss calculators because I think students who use the TI-80 series have a distinct advantage. Those calculators are expensive, and I don't think that's fair to students to have a calculator that literally can just kick out permutations and combinations, um, and other students don't. But my job is to give the best advice that I can, and I do have to point out there that these uh, calculators, the TI-80 series, the TI Inspires, they all have pre-programmed functions to solve combinations and permutations questions. So just so you understand, a combination and a permutation, they're basically figuring out how many sets of subsets you can get out of something. So for example, you can have a combination of, there's 10 players on a basketball team, only five of them can be on the court at a given time. How many combinations of five athletes can you have if those are the rules of basketball? And you'd plug in 10, and then you'd go to your calculator, you'd press the combination button, you'd put in five for the subgroup, and it'll spit right out how many combinations there are of those five basketball teams. So I'd encourage you to spend a little time just reviewing combinations and permutations. Not a huge topic, but it does show up, and particularly how these calculators can do that. Um, I would also encourage students a used calculator does addition just as well as a new calculator. There's a lot of these TI-80 series floating around on the internet at much more affordable prices than what you can find new from the store. So if it is going to be a cost burden, do try to find one of the used ones. It's a lot cheaper that way and every bit as good as a new one. One last thing is to make sure that I point out to you that the SAT has a free response section on it on each of the two math sections. So SAT has two math sections, one of them with calculator, one of them without calculator. Without calculator is not any more difficult in terms of the underlying math. Uh, in some ways, it's actually easier. They don't expect you to do long division problems. Generally, there might be one question like that. The rest are going to have usually pretty simple numbers to work with, so you don't have to do like, you know, 787 divided by 1.86. Nobody's doing that in a reasonable amount of time. They don't have that on the no calc. The calculator section, again, a little bit more tricky in terms of calculations, had to be a little bit more precise, but it's not a night and day. It's like a little bit more difficult than, of course, you have your calculator. On both of those sections, however, the last couple questions are going to be free response. So it's going to be the last five questions on the no-calc, the last eight questions on the calculator section. But they're just bubble in. They're not themselves, again, any more difficult. And generally speaking, um, especially the early free response questions are easy as the easiest multiple choice questions. The only thing I'll say else about the free responses, if you get a negative answer, you've gone off the tracks. All the answers are positive, and I've heard an urban legend. I have no way of verifying this, but I put it out there. If you do have to guess blind, I have heard that the even answers show up twice as frequently as odd answers. So take your best even guess and go from there with the free responses. All right, so now we're going to talk about the critical reading here. And critical reading is pretty identical across to the, both the tests, excuse me. It's basically these four categories. ACT is very straightforward, four passages. Prose fiction, social sciences, humanities, natural sciences, always in that order, one passage. Uh, and then there is a paired passage can show up on any of those four categories, but it's one, two, three, four, and 10 questions per passage. SAT is a little different. So far, it's been six passages per test, um, somewhere around eight to 10, maybe even a few more questions per section, or sorry, per passage, a little bit more mixed up. The SAT also has the archaic writing 
section. So that's going to be either a passage from a book written in the early 20th century or the 19th century, or it's going to be a speech or letter given by somebody from the 19th century. It's a little bit more challenging primarily because of the vocabulary and diction. So do be aware of that. And if you have a chance to practice that, if you don't have an English program or a reading class where they read those old texts, do try to at least read, say, Jane Eyre or um, something from Jane Austen, just so you're a little bit familiar with that. Um, prose fiction is going to be the first section, at least on the ACT, and it's generally been so far on the SAT as well. And prose fiction is a section, a short story, or a, a, sorry, a section from a novel or a short story, and basically it's about 500 to 850 words or so. The key to the prose fiction passage is that it's about characters. So we're going to talk a little bit in the next uh, slide when we get there about how you should break these passages down. But what you want to focus on with prose fiction is characters. Who are the characters? What are their relationships to each other? How do you know that? What are their attitudes and opinions? How do you know that? What are their personalities like? And how do you know that? There's not enough room for a whole lot of plot questions. It's 500 to 850 words. The plot's usually summarized in a single sentence. They don't care about things like theme or um, literary devices or uh, repeating figures or motifs. It's about characterization. How do authors create characters and give them distinct personalities? And how do you know that? How do you know one character has this feeling about another character? So focus on characters with prose fiction. With social science, these passages are generally about things that have to do with, uh, let's say, the relationships of people. So it might be about how the car became more popular in the United States and from the 19, 1900 to 1950. It might be about how suburban sprawl is or is not a problem. It might be about young people's participation in politics. It might be about the development of dancing in the 1980s. Just something about what people do on a broad basis. And the thing to understand about this passage, which is nonfiction, and the other nonfiction passages, the humanities and natural science passages, is that at the end of the day, they're about experts writing to an audience. And broadly speaking, experts do two things. They explain things to non-experts, they get into arguments with other experts. The easier passages tend to be where an expert is trying to explain something to a larger audience. So imagine a historian trying to explain how um, the uh, Harlem Renaissance occurred and what was d happened during it and when it ended. That would be one thing that you might see on a social science passage, and it's going to be pretty explanatory. The higher difficulty passages are going to have an expert getting into arguments with other experts without always making that clear. So, for example, you might have a passage about, uh, let's say, recycling. And the passage author might say, some believe that recycling is an unmixed good. There's no downside to doing it. But they ignore these costs. Well, they haven't cited any experts, but implicitly that author is arguing over whether or not uh, these other experts are right that recycling is absolutely good and has no downsides. That's what you want to focus on, the implicit arguments with other experts, because what they're going to try and do is they're going to try and misattribute opinions to either the author or to the other individuals involved, the other experts that are being implied, implicitly argued with. So focus on whether or not basic explanation, great, you're just looking for facts and what comes first, what comes next, or whether you have opinions that are being expressed and make sure you keep straight whose opinion is whose. After that, we have humanities. Humanities passages are about art, broadly speaking. Could be a classical musician's career, could be about a particular style of sculpture, could be about a particular um, school of dance or style of dance, but it's generally about art. The easier passages, like the easier social science passages, an expert is trying to explain something to you. In the higher difficulty passages, you have an artist 
reflecting or thinking about inspiration or what caused them or other artists to make certain artistic choices in their lives. So what you get with the humanities is that an artist might say something like, when I was a young painter, I wanted to capture light. And then as I became older, I wanted to capture darkness. And now that I am a mature artist, I want to capture the interplay of light and darkness. Well, you can be sure that if the artist says something about that, about their inspiration or about what their focus is, there's going to be a question that misattributes what the artist is trying to do. There will be a question that says, the author care, or sorry, the painter characterized their goals as a young painter as capturing the interplay of light and dark. Notice that's not what I said. The mature artist in their last stage wanted to capture the interplay of light and dark. That's a misattribution, but it's a fact that you could see in the passage, and if you're not careful about, might trap you. So be careful with the higher difficulty humanities passages. Who is saying what thing about what is going on? After that, natural science. And natural science, pretty straightforward. It's what you see in your science classes. So it could be a passage about some chemical reaction or some mystery in chemistry. Um, I've seen in practice materials a passage about the formation of snowflakes, for example. Could be biology, could be astronomy, could be volcanology about volcanoes. Something having to do with the natural world. Again, the easier passages and experts trying to explain something to you. The harder passages are about why scientists got something wrong, what studies or experiments they did to figure out a question or a lingering issue, and then what questions remain to be answered. And again, you want to be careful because they're going to misattribute things. They are going to say, oh, this conclusion that the scientists had when they first started the research, that's actually the conclusion they came to at the end of all the research, right? And the answer is, nope, that's not the way it's going to be set up. It's going to be in the passage. You're going to be able to find it in the passage but it's being misused and you're actually going to get it incorrect if you're not careful about that. So let's talk a little bit about the mechanics of these passages. And so first things first, most common question I get about critical reading is passage first, questions first. The answer is this, always passage first. If you attack the questions first, what ends up happening is that you have to reread the passage pretty much for every single question. You read the passage first, you read it one time, relatively quickly, trying to focus on where things are in the passage. Don't try to memorize the passage. Don't try to even understand everything necessarily in the passage. Focus on what Thing, where things can be found and where you can come back to find them. So you do that, you read the passage once, and then what you're doing is for each question you're just going back to the part of the passage that you need to look at to find the correct answer. You're not trying to look through the whole thing again and again. You start with the questions, you don't know where that information is, and you end up skimming the, the whole passage for almost every single question. So you might end up reading a passage two, three times if you read it first. If you attack the questions first, you're going to end up reading that passage perhaps as many as seven or eight times. So it may seem a little strange, but it actually saves you time to read the passage first. You want to take some brief notes, and um, the handouts that we have for the live presentations have a sample passage all marked up that should be available for download as well. But the main idea is you don't have to write careful notes along the side, underlining key points or key ideas, circling them, arrows, a brief word here and there, a star next to somebody's name. You know, for the prose fiction, you might want to circle every time a character appears, or the first time a character appears. Those kind of notes can both be very helpful in going back to the passage, and they usually don't take too long. It takes less time than you think. So I have indicate conflict here. That's for the prose fiction passages. Usually there is some kind of conflict between at least one character and another. If you can find that, you can almost always be assured that's going to be one of the questions there. After you've gone ahead, you've read the passage, you've marked it up a little bit to help you find stuff, you attack the questions, you read the question, you try to answer the question first before looking at the answer choices. Now that's not going to work for every single question. Some questions you're not going to have a good idea. Some questions are phrased in a way that makes it impossible. They say, which of the following? Well, you can't predict that. You've got to look at the answer choices and go back to the passage. 
But generally speaking, the large majority of questions you can predict an answer to, and you want to do that. The reason why is because you are stressed when you are taking these tests. You are trying to get to the answer as quickly as you possibly can. The problem with that is, is the test maker knows it. And they know that if you look at an answer choice and the first half of it looks perfect, your brain is going to want to stop looking at the second half, pick that answer, and be done and move on. So what they do is they trap people who aren't careful readers by making the first half of an answer choice absolutely correct, putting one single word that is not accurate or characterizes what's in the passage, and then the rest of the answer choice is correct. If you try to answer the question first before looking at those answer choices, you're much less likely to be caught by that kind of a trap because you're looking for something, not just receiving suggestions from the test maker as to why this answer or that answer might be correct on first glance. So try to answer the question first, then go to the answer choices. It helps avoid getting trapped by tempting wrong answer choices. The SAT has also a certain question type where they will give you a question, whatever it is, the question after it says, where in the passage would you best find support for this answer? These questions are some of the most miserable ones my students see, but the good news is if you turn them around, they can actually make the pair easier to solve. So here's what I mean by that. When you look at a section on the test, so you turn over to your first reading section, you see the passage on one side, you see the questions on the other, just quickly skim the questions and look for the one that says, the ones that say, which of the following best supports your answer in the prior question? Circle the number around that prior question. It shouldn't take you very long. It should take you a few seconds for each passage because what happens is when you look at that first question, guess what? The second question actually gives you four hints as to where the answer is. So if you turn that question style around, look at those four locations, then do the question in front of it, you actually have a roadmap to answering that first question instead of just going blind on it. So you can actually take some of the more challenging and tricky question types, turn it on its head, and actually make it one of the easier question types that are out there. So remember, you don't have to do these in the order the test maker gives them to you. You just have to do them in the allotted time. So feel free to go ahead, skim for those linked questions, look at the second one before the first one, and let that guide your approach. After that, we have multiple choice writing. So this is the English section, as it's often called. And so for this, there's two question types. There are the grammar questions, and there are the editing questions, as I generally call them. Grammar questions go like this. There's an underlined section of the passage. You look at the underlined section of the passage, and then the answer choices, there's only four. No change, and then three variations on that underlined section. Those are the grammar questions. What you want for those is you want to pick the most correct, concise, and relevant answer. Most correct, that's pretty straightforward, means no grammar errors. Most relevant, that's also really straightforward. That means it doesn't change the meaning of the sentence. It's not a big deal. Maybe one or two questions for passage really raise that issue. Concision is the secret on the writing section. They always want the shortest grammatically correct answer. If you have two answer choices and they are both grammatically correct and one is longer than the other one, you do not want that longer one. You want the shorter one. You pick the shorter one, you are good to go and move on. The test makers implicitly believe that good writers do not use excess words. They say what they mean to say and they move on. Wordiness is disfavored. So what does length mean? It means word count. Generally speaking, I don't encourage students to actually literally count the words in each of these answers. You just basically eyeball it, and usually that's just fine enough. But if you are trying to decide between two answer choices, they both look correct, one of them shorter than the other, pick the shorter one and move on. In fact, on most of the grammar questions, you can work from the shortest answer choice back to the longest answer choice, and that way the first question you see, if you're working from your shortest to longest, if it's grammatically correct, you're done and you can move right on. You might want to check them just to be sure that you're not missing something, but in theory, you work from shortest to longest, the first grammatically correct answer, that's it. 
So I do want to talk a little bit about the editing questions before we dive into the grammar to know, because the editing questions have different formats and they're answered in a different style. The editing questions give you a question stub. They're something along the lines of the author wants to add this information. The author wants to delete this information. The author wants to reorganize this passage. The author wants to emphasize descriptive language. Your goal is to answer that stub's goal. You don't have to worry about grammar. All the sections are grammatically correct, and you don't have to worry about wordiness unless the question stub explicitly talks about length or wordiness. What you have to focus on is which of these answer choices best does what the stub wants. Length doesn't matter, grammar doesn't matter, it's really critical reading. You're really revising to help the author achieve his or her goals. So, don't worry about grammar with those questions that have a stub, it's not an issue. It's about the editing and about the arrangement, about um, cause and effect, the right flow, the right uh, join, um, transition between two paragraphs, not classic grammar. So, with that said, let's actually take a look at the grammar you're expected to know, and that's going to be, first of all, subject-verb agreement. So this is a tricky issue that's usually fundamental. In many cases, it's, I take that back, it's not tricky, but at the highest difficulty, it can catch even students who are quite good at grammar. And I'll give you an example of that. So in English, we have this, this I don't know what you call it, but at least it's how we speak, this grammar rule, that if you have a singular noun, the verb gets the S. The cat runs. Cat singular, verb runs, ends in S. Now let's say you have plural nouns, the cats. Well, when you have the cats, the run does not get the S. So the cat runs, the cats run. That's a general rule in English. Most of our singular verbs end in S. Many of our plural verbs do not end in S. They lose that. So the way the test maker makes this tricky is they like to do something like this. The leader of the students sit or sits by the stage. The leader of the student sits by the stage. The leader of the students sit by the stage. I hope I got one with S and one without there. but. What you're really looking here is the leader, not the students. That's the trap here, because your ear is going to hear the leader of the students. Students is going to be the last word it hears, so you're going to want the verb to match it. The leader of the students sit by the stage, because students will sit by the stage. That is wrong. That's a common trap. It's the leader that you want to look for. They're the subject of that verb, not what's coming after that um, prepositional phrase of the students. So that's the kind of technical grammar you're going to end up having to review if you're getting more into trying to improve your score on the writing section. After that, you have something like pronouns and prepositions. So that's the classic. John and I went to the store, but they gave the change to John and me. I versus me rule. A lot of students have heard, oh, it's always I. And the answer is no, it doesn't matter. If it's John and I, it's not going to be, they gave the change to John and I. That's incorrect. What it really is, it's the same thing it would normally be if you didn't have a compound object there. If you just had, they gave the change to me, then it's going to be, they gave the change to John and me. Those are the types of pronoun issues that you're tested on here. Prepositions, those are things like for, by, between, of. And the big issue there is that when you mix these together, you have the question, who and whom, for example. Who, it comes before the preposition. Whom comes after. For whom the bell tolls. For is a preposition. Whom is being used in this case as the object of that preposition for whom the bell tolls. Punctuation is a big issue. Commas, hyphens, colons, semicolons, and apostrophes. Those are the big five punctuation marks that they test here. Let me see if I can get these in the same order. So you have commas, hyphens, colons, semicolons, apostrophes. Those are the big five. Make sure you review the rules for those other four. They're pretty simple. The hyphen, colon, semicolon, apostrophe. Only one or two rules for each of those. Punctuation 
and then commas. Commas are the big ones you want to make sure you review. Maybe you want to pick up one of those books or get it from the library. Um, some of the more simple grammar guides like Eats, Shoots, and Leaves is one that's been out for quite a while. Maybe your parents even picked it up. That's the sort of thing you probably want to review for commas. After that, we have diction and usage, further or farther. Um, further is used for metaphorical distance. Farther is used for literal distance. So um, Washington, D.C. is farther from us than New York City here in Vermont. Why? Or how can you remember that? Well, remember, you can always walk far. You can't walk fur. So that's how you remember that Far or farther is used for actual distances. Further is used for metaphorical distance. We are further along in our studies of the SAT than we were when we started. Taking a look then onto the essay sections of both tests, and then we'll talk a little bit about the science for the ACT, and then that'll probably be it for today. Uh, the SAT essay is very new, and it is really an old uh, essay type taken from the AP language and composition. They give you an essay, you have to read the essay, and then you have to analyze what the author is doing in that. Why did they choose to use so much figurative language? Why did they choose to use these statistics? Why did they choose to use these quotes from experts? Why did they choose to use hyperbole in a given paragraph? They want you to identify those things that the author is doing and then explain why the author chose to use those techniques in the context of his or her overall goal. So, it's not hard, but it does take some practice. And so I've got here a real uh, general summation of what they're looking for. Figures of speech, slippery slopes, if we don't stop this, then this, this, this is going to happen. Mistakes or oversights that they may have found in their argument or in other people's arguments that they bring up. And then good points that are used to really persuade the reader of the main overall goal. So I have here almost a breakdown of what you should be thinking about writing word by word, sentence by sentence. If you go and you go to the College Board website for the SAT and you look at these practice essays, you'll see essays that get top scores and they just have a one or two sentence introduction. What it is is in his or her essay, John Smith, Jane Smith explores the issue or shares his opinion or argues for her position that people should do this, that people should not do that, that countries should do this. Remember that the goal of an author in these essays is to persuade the reader of something, and they want you to identify that main large goal at the beginning of your essay and then explain how the verbal, rhetorical, literary techniques, whatever you want to call it, how they play into the author achieving their goal. So the main goal of the author is to convince, persuade, explain, problematize, raise issues with the reader's understanding or convince them to accept that this is the right way to go, that we should do this, that we shouldn't do that. So what you're saying is the author tries to explain something in order that the reader understands that we should do something or not do something else. That's pretty much the introduction. After that, you can start the body paragraphs with the author uses hyperbole or colorful language or statistics or um, appeals to ethos or pathos uh, in order to get the reader to personally feel connected to the issue, to intellectually trust the author as an expert, to find themselves more worried or concerned about the consequences of inaction. But you're trying to explain what the technique does in terms of advancing the author's goals. And keep in mind, it has to be anchored on focusing on the reader, so the effect on the reader, to persuade the reader, to dissuade the reader, to engage the reader, to make the reader concerned. But you always want to say the author does X to have this effect on the reader as the start to your paragraph, something to that effect, and then you list the examples and you explain how they show the author's intended goals with the usage of that particular technique.
Now, one issue that students often have is that, what am I coming up with? Like, I can maybe identify statistics, I can identify quotes, but what are they looking for here? And so here's just a brief list of some of the stuff that you might want to notice. So you have comparing and contrasting. You know, the author compares this and contrasts that in order for the reader to understand that one particular path or solution has a lot of benefits versus a lot of costs. Metaphorical language, uh, repetition of a point, lists show up a lot, we must be smart, wise, and careful. That kind of writing. By repeating points, the author creates a sense of emphasis while also showing that there is a breadth of uh, good reasons to do a certain thing. Slippery slope arguments, the author says, we must stop this in order to prevent that. Cause and effect, first we must do this to achieve that. Repetition, especially of repeated lists of nouns or repeated examples. Um, from the shores of Montezuma to the halls of, or backwards, from the halls of uh, Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli, you have a repetition of form there, for example. Um, and so just so you know, the test is not going to grade you for you how technical your uh, identified techniques are. You could say the author appeals to emotion. That's pretty simple. You don't have to say the author appeals to uh, pathos. And you certainly don't have to get into, we have a hyperbolic use of litotic language here and uh, the usage of understatement when the queen says, I am not amused. That's way more technical than what they're looking for. You don't have to get into that. You want to try and shoot for at least a page and a half, but keep in mind, longer scores better. It's an unfortunate correlation. It's the strongest correlation between score and um, any other factor on this test. I think organization is actually more important at the end of the day, but I do have to tell you, length does matter because the idea that a strong writer can start early, can organize their, their thoughts almost on the fly, doesn't need too much time to actually organize or put out an outline. They can dive in quickly, they produce quickly, and you just wind up with more writing on the page with a stronger author relative to a weaker one. Um, you want to shoot for four to five paragraphs of five to six sentences each. One less, one more is not in and of itself something that they are grading for, but it is something that, again, you want to try and write as much as you can and go from there. After that, ACT essay six paragraph persuasive essay. ACT essay much easier, I think, for most students than the SAT essay. ACT, sorry, SAT essay is very new. Who knows how colleges are using it? The vast majority of colleges do not require that right now because I think colleges just don't know what to do with it. ACT essay, very straightforward. It is a persuasive essay. They give you a topic, uh, you know, some problem in society, some issue that students might face in their everyday lives. They give you three perspectives on the issue, and the easiest thing is to pick one of them, defend that through your body paragraphs, uh, then last paragraph before your, your conclusion, you want to address the other two positions, either show their weaknesses or address potential criticisms from people who hold those other two positions, and then a conclusion. So we'll keep in mind what you want, though, is make sure that you... Um, you have a clear organization, so you have an introduction paragraph that starts with what is the topic, just rephrase the topic, summarize the three positions, and then give your thesis. If you can foreshadow the evidence you're going to use, that's going to be great, but the big thing is what's the topic, what are the positions, what's your position, and then if you can in that introduction, foreshadow the examples you're going to use. So five goals of education, I'm afraid, I'm sorry, I wasn't careful enough on this slide. They've moved away from very education-focused problems, things students would encounter in their everyday lives. You might run into an education, but things now are like automation in society, global warming, uh, achieving a more diverse diverse workplace, accommodating people with disabilities and more jobs, all sorts of stuff that occur across broad society are now where the ACT is going. Grammar is not a concern on this test or the SAT essay unless you're making systematic and repeated errors across the whole essay. You misspell a word, you have a comma in the wrong place, an apostrophe shouldn't have been there. The readers don't care about that. They care about do you know how grammar works at all. After that, one thing that I want to add here, and again, I apologize, I should have added this on this slide, you can totally make up facts on the ACT essay. You are not being graded in any way, shape, or form about the truth of the examples you use. This is a composition 
test. They're testing your ability to construct an essay because, quite frankly, if you're taking this um, the beginning of your senior year, just let's say, within 12 months, you're going to be taking a college exam where you have to write out an essay answer. They want to know you at least know how to put an essay together. They don't care about the facts being true. They don't care. If you say 87% of students, according to a study conducted by the New York Times, and it was actually 86, you're not going to lose any points on that. That's not what they care about. Use examples that are truthy, that are similar to what you would use if you did have time to research the issue, but don't get bogged down in, I don't know any statistics or science about this. They don't care. They just want to know that you can use statistics and other types of evidence as if you did have time to research it. So the essay is read by two readers in under two minutes each. They then give their scores. If the scores are off by more than a point, it goes to a third reader. That's how it's scored. So keep in mind, your readers are not spending a whole lot of time on this. In fact, they are required to get it done in under two minutes, and they are instructed not to reread. So if they don't get it through on the first time, they are told to ignore it. So that's a reminder. Handwriting is not something that they grade on, but if your handwriting is so bad they can't even read it, they're not going to try to very hard. So do try to make sure you write carefully enough that somebody else is able to read your handwriting. Again, length. More is better than less on these essays, and uh, you want to try and shoot for at least two pages on them. Science, and then we're going to talk a little bit about resources, but the science section is actually one of probably the most misunderstood sections. It is not about walking in there with a whole lot of science knowledge in your head. It is about being able to interpret and analyze data first and foremost, pull information from charts, graphs, and tables, and then after that, understanding the scientific method. Do you know why the scientist has a control? Do you know which of the data columns is the control? Are you able to analyze then other, um, other experiments or other studies or other trials where they modify the conditions, where they modify the controls? That's really what they're looking for here. So it's not did you memorize a whole lot of biofacts? Do you remember a lot of your, you know, acid bases, PA reaction? Nothing like that. They're going to put everything on the page. They might be one or two basic science questions. You know, is PA is an acidic base, low pH, or excuse me, acidic base. There we go. Good one. Um, is an acid a low pH or high pH? Is a base a low pH or a high pH? It doesn't get much more complicated than that basic kind of science knowledge really about data interpretation and how do they you use the scientific method to go from one experiment or trial to another experiment or trial. One thing that I encourage students to do with the science section is to get handsy with it, underline, mark it up, use your pencil as a straight edge. They are very precise in terms of reading those charts on the ACT. So if you're off by a little bit, you're off. And you want to mark it up, you want to get close into it, use your finger to anchor on the point of data you're looking at, your other finger to point at another piece of data if you need to, but really put your fingers, put your pencil into those charts and graphs to make sure that you're getting the right thing and the right relationships. After that, um, I want to talk a little bit about where you can find some of these resources on your own. I am, I mean, I am a private tutor, but it always troubles me how much it costs to get started with preparation on this, and that's one of the reasons why I enjoy the opportunity to work with VSAC. There's a lot more out there these days than there used to be. The SAT has done a great job, the College Board has done a great job of really making more resources available. They took the position for a very long time that you can't improve your scores on these tests. With the new revision and their work with Khan Academy, they've taken a complete 180 on this, and they are now saying, let's help students try to improve their scores and show the best foot forward that they can put the best foot forward. Um, I can also tell you that the Khan Academy, I have a friend who does some of their data analysis. They really do try to put materials out there that help students improve their scores. That is very much a goal of theirs. So I, I really do believe that the College Board has really changed its approach on preparation in a good and positive way that I think is impactful for students who are motivated to improve their scores. So that you can take the tests on the College Board website. They're linked through 
through to lesson modules on Khan Academy, particularly with math and grammar, those can be really powerful ways to catch up on the skills and concepts that you need. ACT is just not there yet, though. Um, that doesn't mean that the ACT is a worse tester company. I'm not saying anything like that. They just don't have the same resources available. Um, and don't be afraid to use, because again, these tests are very similar to each other. What you learn in the math on uh, for the SAT, it's going to carry over to the ACT, 95, 98% of that stuff. So it really does help to prepare, for, really does help for the other test to prepare for the first one. So College Board puts out a big old book of eight tests called the Blue Book informally. Um, you can also download all those tests for free off the internet. So if you're comfortable with that, they're all up there. You can get them for free. You don't actually have to buy that book. ACT, again, not quite as, as advanced yet in terms of helping students. They do put the Red Book out of um, their own real release tests. Uh, it's not too expensive. I think it's somewhere like $17, $18 right now, but that is where you can get most of their tests. Khan Academy is a great resource generally. Of course, the College Board uh, connection is great, but of course, they just have all that math concept stuff out there anyway, so you can watch the videos without really having it connected to the College Board. Um, the ACT and SAT pamphlets, good resources for getting started with breaking down the test and reading the instructions, making sure you know what you're doing the first time out. Um, Wikibooks.org, good resource again, primarily math, although if you are looking to improve on the um, archaic language passages on the critical reading, you can find a lot of older texts there. Again, I, just off the top of my head, recommend um, usually Jane Eyre, Jane Austen, or um, I also have a fond spot for James Fenimore Cooper. We live literally across the lake here in northwestern Vermont from the Appalachian Mountains um, and the Adirondacks in particular. All just a series of novels, good 19th century writing set just across the lake in New York. So it's a little more familiar to to the students in uh, Vermont. After that, Free Rice, that's an older one, as is the link below to Wikipedia for improving vocabulary. They have dialed down the vocabulary on the SAT, but both the SAT and ACT do still have vocabulary questions left, so it may be worth your time, especially if you're starting early as a sophomore, to put in maybe, you know, 15, 20 minutes a week trying to improve your vocabulary and build up on words. It takes a long time, but it doesn't take hard work. Again, you spend some time on free rice, spend 15 minutes, learn 10 new words, make sure you copy those words down, review them over the course of the week for a few minutes, not spending a whole lot of time, not spending hours doing it, but if you're consistent about it and you do it over the course of a year, you can really pick up some vocabulary that can pay off on test day. And that's about it, for folks. Um, again, I'm going to repeat my email. If you have questions, it is mshagam at gmail.com, M-S-H-A-G-A-M -A -A at gmail.com. Um, if and when we have the Q&A session, I will take questions from that and answer them as best I can. I'll also put out there that if you're a student with learning uh, needs, feel free to shoot me questions. I have worked with students with all sorts of learning needs. There's accommodations, there's strategies, and I am happy to answer those questions. And of course, if you email me, I will keep that confidential. Um, anything else? Otherwise, um, be in touch. Otherwise, folks, um, I wish you all the best. It's a long road, but it is one that you can walk down successfully on your path to the college of your choice. Thank you very much.